hope you've all had a wonderful day. And yeah, thank you for those who <laughs> always say some very nice things in the comments. And I'm really glad to have you here for this conversation. Uh, we have... Uh, can we just close that? Yeah, so we have Joel Thomas. Uh, glad to have you here. We have Horse. Looking forward to the grand reveal. Thank you. Tom Gyokai. As we say in the States, Lloyd is going to hit it out of the park. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. Thank you. And Koriesu, Jacobus, Greek, Jacob, Hebrew, Jacobus, Latin. They all sound like James to me. Yeah, they do. Because James has that hard B in it. Don't forget, James has the hard B. And we have Eva, Eva. Shalom, everyone. Villainous, welcome. Always good to see you. Uh, yeah, guys, thank you very much for being here. Let me... Right, okay, so everything's set up, and I think we're, everything is streaming really well, so that's going good. Uh, so yeah, everyone can hear me okay? There's no audio issues, right? I trust there are no audio issues. Okay, so you can just give me a one in the chat to let me know that audio is coming through fine. We're on a short delay. I've had some small internet issues in the recent past, as you know, so I've just slowed down the... Uh, I'm not on uh, ultra fast settings at the moment. No audio issues. That's fantastic. Okay, then we can run ahead. Okay, guys. So let me jump into the presentation then. And yeah, so this one's very short. It's about 16 slides at, at most. And um, Protestant Believer, welcome. PJ, Shalom. Jelani, welcome and God bless. Thanks, everyone. All right. So we're going to be talking about James, the book of James. Or is it... The book of Jacob. Now, I, I believe it is fair to say and honest to say that it is the book of Jacob. It is not the book of James. It is fair if I were to walk into a class at university and simply say, this is the book of Jacob. Let's talk about that or in your church. Time phaser, welcome. Welcome very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for signing up. I much appreciate the support. All right. Yeah, I spend a great deal of time on this, so I, I do appreciate the these these um, the, the generous donations and, and the fact that you are willing to support me. It's it's really inspiring and motivational. And uh, yeah, recently this week, um, what's what's new this week? Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time reading the Catholic Catechism. I've spent time reading the um, Formula of Concord, which is the foundational um, creed for the Lutheran Church. I had no idea they actually had one. <laughs> But they do. So it's not just what anyone says in the comment section. It's actually, here's what the church actually stresses is its sets of beliefs. And I've spent a lot of time reading on Luther's actual original writings in the German as well, comparing the German and the English on his views on free will and predestination. It's just odd that in the German, it might say one thing, the English translation doesn't always match what he said in the English. And then you read some people speaking about it and it... Man, when I read the Formula of Concord and I read Luther's actual writings, I don't see them match up that well. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously seeing what to me is a disconnect. I need more time on this, but I'm starting to see a disconnect about Luther's beliefs and what the Lutherans actually ended up deciding this goes into the Formula of Concord. So there's already a deviation from what I can tell from the beliefs of Luther himself. Um, no problem. I love your content, Lloyd. Well, thank you, Time Phase. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Daduza, welcome. Lightning. Shalom, Lloyd, sisters and brothers. Welcome. Yeah. And um, also, when I read the Formula of Concord on free, free will and predestination, it it gives non-answers. It's it's kind of a circular logic. It actually, how can I say this? I'm uh, Look, I've been spending, I spent a couple of hours on it, just going through that particular chapter. And it just it doesn't actually answer the question because it, it, it kind of waffles. It's wishy-washy. It says some things, but it's a non-answer. It's, it, it's driving me nuts. And I've been looking at it in the German as well. I've been looking at the English, been looking at the original German, and it's, it, it, man, I'm, I'm just like this. It doesn't answer the question. It leaves loopholes. Understand it? It leaves you room to go left or to go right, like the Quran. Like, exactly. It's kind of like, it's, it's not clear on some issues. It leaves option to waffle this way or waffle that way, depending... Yeah, it's, it's a little incoherent, and, and that bothers me, but moving on from that point. He never returns to those. I can't read the Catechism anymore, but Father Jenkins has a great series explaining the traditional Catechism. All right, yeah. Uh, Protestant believer, Episcopal leading to Catholic. Yeah, what does Episcopal mean? I believe it's Anglican, right? If I recall, Episcopalian Church, same as me. All right. Um, 
Yep. So, yeah, what can I say? I, I think I'm Episcopal leaning towards Catholic as well at this point. Um, I have been looking at the Eastern Orthodox, right? And I find a few things there that, that look, I mean, no offense. And I'm really not trying to offend people in the Eastern Orthodox religion, but it's, it's kind of unexamined. It's kind of a mystery to most people. It's fairly unknown. But there are some issues there that I think I may have found that, that this is not something I would consider. But it's a puzzle from Pope Luther. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so look, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but I, I'm really, because here's an interesting thing. When I talk to Calvinists, for instance, it's more specific, but it's the same with Lutherans. When you ask them about their beliefs, they'll tell you this is their opinion on it. But I have asked several Calvinists, please quote me what lawyer John Calvin wrote. Not what you think he wrote, not your interpretation, but just what did Calvin himself say? That is, I have not been answered yet. I find it odd. If the man, if you call yourself a Calvinist, why are you afraid to quote me John Calvin? Are you ignorant? Then then why are you waffling on like you're an expert? Or are you ashamed of his words? In which case, what are you hiding? Why? Understand? These are these are questions I have. So leading to Catholicism, praise the Lord. Okay, so the truth hurts sometimes, Tom. Yeah. Okay, so look, I'm just being honest with you guys. I'm being upfront. You've never had to wonder what my thoughts are or opinions. All right. Okay, let us jump into this. James or Jacob in the Bible, the book of Jacob. So I came across this article by uh, Mark Wilson, a South African of all things, a professor of, uh, we'll get into that, right? And this is the general epistle of James. James, a servant of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So he's speaking to the 12 tribes, the book of James. And it's considered to be one of the most, if not the most, Jewish, quote unquote, um, scriptures in the New Testament. All right. And this painting, this is Baroque artist Guido Reni. He's depicting the apostle James, some of the son of Zebedee in the painting, St. James the Greater. Okay. If it's the same James, I'm not sure, probably is. Right? It's just a lovely painting, so I decided to use it. Okay, but let's let's go on. Uh, let me just close that. Right, this is Mark Wilson. So he's the director of Asia Minor Research Center in Antalya, Turkey. He's a popular teacher on the um, Biblical Associates um, travel and study tours. He received his doctorate in Biblical Studies from the University of South Africa, Pretoria, where he serves as a research fellow in Biblical Archaeology. Right, He's currently Associate Professor um, of New Testament at Stellenbosch University. He leads field studies in Turkey and the Eastern Mediterranean for university, seminary, and church groups. He's the author of Biblical Turkey, a guide to the Jewish and Christian sites of Asia, Minor. And he's also apparently worked in the U.S. at some university, and he's been a lecturer. So the guy's got, there's actually more to his uh, CV than this from what I recall reading. So, and these are some of the some of the notes here from where we're pulling some of this information. I'm going to use some of this and then also use other sources. Okay. Eric Braun, welcome. FP, welcome. All right. Jacobus, precisely, Daduza. It's Jacobus. Okay. So, here we go. Some archaeology. I like archaeology because it's solid, literally solid, factual. Right. It's, it's the inscriptions, you know, it's solid. So let's start with a man called Yaakov. Yaakov, Yakub, is Jacob. So this is a close-up of an inscription in Hebrew that reads Yaakov, right? Excuse me if I butcher the, the Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. And Yaakov is Hebrew for Jacob. And it is seen on this ancient box that is used to bury human bones, known as an ossuary, right? And that's the inscription there. That's I've cleaned it up as much as I can. Nathan Jacob Rajan, welcome. Troy English, welcome. Jesus saves from hell, welcome. Good to see you all. All right. So, now, that script, this here, this seems to be the earliest reference to Jesus. It is very likely that archaeologically, this is the very, very earliest reference to Jesus in an inscription. It's the oldest written inscription that mentions Jesus. Right? And here's a book called The Brother of Jesus, the dramatic story and meaning of the first archaeological link to Jesus and his family. Herschel Shanks and Ben Witherington III, I've actually read through quite a bit of his stuff, I've used some of his articles, seems to be a very good scholar, Protestant scholar, but really good scholar. Okay, foreword by André Lamer, professor, we'll get to him. And this could well be the earliest artifact ever found relating to the existence of Jesus. So this is important. Okay, if this is the very earliest, here's the ossuary, and the inscription is here. There's an inscription here. Right, 
This book is called The First Definitive Account of What Scholars in the Media Are Calling The Most Important Archaeological Discovery About Jesus and His Family. Right. Um, is it ILU or double I, double zero, double one, double O? Um, yeah, I sent the notification out like two and a half hours ago, so I'm sorry if you didn't get it. Oh yeah, my favorite field, archaeology. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's really helpful. I uh, my 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 subscription to um, Biblical Archaeological Society has uh, expired, and I'm thinking I need to pardon me resubscribe because they come up with some fantastic finds. I mean, some brilliant stuff. These guys are are seriously bringing the work, and they they are bringing the evidence when it comes to proving the book, the Bible historically and archaeologically. On, on, off, off. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Broughton. Okay, let me get on with this. So this book, this whole this whole story about this Osiris is very controversial. Okay. Went to court, spent like five years in court. Eventually, it was thrown out of court. Well, the case ended. The judge said, look, we, the prosecution has not proved its case that this is a fraud because someone eventually going to say, Lord, it's a fraud. Blah, blah. It was never proven to be a fraud. Okay. was n was not proven. So moving on. This is the definitive story of the recent discovery of the first century. This is first century. Ossuary, a limestone bone box with the legend, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, written on it. And its implications for understanding Jesus, his family, right? His mother, his father, his brothers, and his followers, and the first Christians, and the Jewish Christian movement in Jerusalem that James led. This Ossuary as the leader. Right now, I know there are going to be Protestants who are going to come on and say, well, you know, James wasn't in charge. You know, James actually, he was he was actually a quarterback, but he wasn't a team captain, you know. And yeah, okay. So this ossuary, right, is the first ever archaeological discovery directly confirming the existence of Jesus and his relationship to his father, Joseph, and brother James, who became the leader of the important Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem. No one is as qualified and well-connected to recount the discovery and its authentication as Herschel Shanks, whose magazine first broke the story. Okay. Ever says, I love how the US is trying to push an agenda that archaeology doesn't provide Bible evidence. They fight. They're very hard to debunk Bible archaeology. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Now, moving on from here. This is the bone box. This is the limestone ossuary. Here's the inscription. Okay, I've tried to clean it up so that you can see this as well as possible. Right, so that is the inscription on the side of the box. Now, the inscription says, oddly enough, strangely enough, the inscription doesn't say James. It says Yaakov, Yaakov, Yakub, the son of Yosef, brother of Yeshua. Okay, and that's the Hebrew over there, apparently. That's the original Hebrew. Now, the owner did not know that Jesus had a brother, nor that the name Yaakov became James in the King James Bible, which is why the owner had this thing for years and didn't realize it was related to Jesus and Jesus' family. Because in the English, it's James, right? The brother of Jesus. And this thing said Yaakov, brother of Jesus. So this guy was like Jacob, brother of Jesus. Must be a different Jesus, right? It's not James, the brother of Jesus. It's Jacob. Must be a different guy completely, different family. So this thing went unknown for a long time because of this. Okay. Uh, J. Park wants to, would this debunk the perpetual virginity? No. Um, look, if you're going to troll, I will get rid of you. I really have no interest and no time for dealing with nonsense. That's off topic. And I have heard nothing but propaganda from people. So let's stay on topic because really, whether you are speaking in good faith or not, I don't know. I can't tell that from the chat. Okay? So, I just assume that people are lying to me because 99% of the time that is the case. So, okay. So now, the owner did not know that Jesus had a brother, nor that the name Yaakov became James in the King James Bible. In fact, it became James long before the King James Bible. It became that a couple of hundred years prior. It was pointed out to him by someone who specializes in Semitic scripts, Professor André Lemaire of the Sorbonne University. Lemaire mentioned it to Shanks, to Herschel Shanks, who then organized another paleographer and a geologist, plus an Aramaic scholar, to study the inscription before announcing it to the world. Right, so the Aramaic scholar, in fact, 
had not seen the brother of written in this form. So this inscription was something that was different, something new, something earlier than anything they'd ever seen, right? So he had to now go and look up this, the form, the brother of written in this form. He looks it up and he finds it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he finds this form written in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is some very early documents, right? So Shanks makes the point that if the ossuary is a forgery, then the forger would have to know Aramaic better than the top scholars in the world alive today. Right? So he had to have known Aramaic as well as those people who had written the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's some very powerful evidence, right? Some very, very powerful evidence. So fine. So, so we start, we're off to an intriguing start. Okay, you've got a form of written script that matches what was in that region by those people at that time. Very unusual. And of course, you've got the mix up because this guy thought James, well, there's. Jacob, brother of Jesus, can't be that, can't be that, that Jesus guy from the Christians, right? So you've got that, Don Hugh, welcome. So James is Jacob, or Yaakov. So from the article of this, the author that I'm reading, at a Bible study at St. Paul Union Church in Antalya, Turkey, Pastor Dennis Massaro was discussing the three men named James in the New Testament. Two were apostles, and the third was the leader of the Jerusalem church and author of the book of James. Participants at this particular study, right, had come from all over the world, including the Netherlands, Iran, Mexico, Moldova, and Cameroon. So a very, very diverse group. Okay. Right. Who is Mick? Don. Right. Right. So moving on. So let's have a look at this, right? So, oh, sorry, my bad. So when he asked what, what the name of these men was in their of this man, sorry, my, my, my bad, a typo. So the pastor asked these men, what was James in their language, in their Bible? All of them said, it's Jacob. So for some reason in the English, it's James, but in all the other languages that these people spoke, the name was Jacob. So let's look at this name in other languages. All right, let's look at this name. In Spanish, Santiago. Okay. Portuguese, Tiago. In Chinese, Yage. Okay? So, Jacob, Yago, Tiago, Yage. Hindi, Yakuba. Arabic, Yakub. Bengali, Yake. Russian, Yakob or Yakov. Right? Japanese, Yakobu. Right? German, Yakob or Yakobus. Okay? Yakobus. Afrikaans, Yakobus. Yakob, Yakobus. Swedish, Jakob. French, Jacques. From the Latin, Jacobus. Right, Italian Giacomo, Dutch Jacobus, Polish Jakub or Jakuba, Hebrew Yaakov, Gospel Greek Jacobos. Right, that's all fascinating. So, do you guys see James here, or do you see Jacob, 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 Jacob? It's indeed Jacob, not James. Exactly. Thanks, Erkan. So, Santo from Santiago, right? means saint or holy in Spanish, but Iago or Iago is a variant of the Hebrew Jacob in Spanish. Sant Iago is a variant of Jacob, of the Hebrew Jacob in Spanish. And in Giacomo, if we look here at the Italian, Como is a variant of the name Jacob in Italian. If I have that, so I was confused. What, James? Yes, the book of James, exactly the confusion. So, in every other language, basically, it is Jacob. Jacob is not James. These are two separate names. So moving on, let's go have a look. Oops, let me just fix that slide. Let me just, uh, I'll see that slide needs a little bit of repair. So let me just sort that out. Okay, right. So let's look at the etymology. Okay, James is altered from Jacob. It's a masculine proper name. Right? The New Testament name of two of Christ's disciples from the late 12th century. Excellent, big sofa. In Serbian, it is also a Yaakov. Thank you very much. So I love the story of Santiago de Compostela where the bones of Jacob wound up. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. So, yeah. Okay. Santiago, Saint Jacobi. Thank you, Erkan, for that information. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So, so you see, you guys know additions, additional information that I either didn't find or didn't have the time or the opportunity to look up. So, Middle English vernacular form of the late Latin Giacomus, okay, Giacomus, 
source of Old French James, Spanish Jaime, Italian Giacomo. We've already seen Giacomo, it becomes Jacob. But it's altered from the Latin Jacobus, see Jacob. Okay, so I went to online etymology dictionary, etym online, and I went to some other sources, and we'll look at those in a moment. Kind of like pineapple and ananas. Right? So, JK, in our language, Kasi, also, it is Jacob. Okay, Jacob. Fantastic, thank you. So the English word James derives from the Old French Jem or Jeme, which equals the Spanish Jaime. Now, Jem, the origin is Hebrew. The name root is Jacob or Yaakov. Fascinating. Where are we getting James from? Jem, the French, derives from the late Latin Jacobus. How the heck did Jacobus become Jem? But this comes from the ancient Greek Jacobus. The name derives from the late Latin Jacobus from the ancient Greek Jacobus. So what is the meaning of Jem in the French? Jem, in the past tense, is Gemte. It's the past participle, Gemt, and the transitive, and it means to hide or to conceal. So the root of James, right? James derives from the old French Jem, which means to hide or to conceal. Now, isn't that odd that the word to hide or to conceal is used to change the word Jacob to James? What are you hiding? What are you concealing? Understand, this is really odd that they would use the term to hide or to conceal to change the name Jacob. So, yeah. Yes, time phaser, this is weird. I, I don't know why. Don't ask me, by, by, but this is very strange. I don't know more about this, but yeah, let's just say there's lots of theories and uh, I probably don't buy any of them. So, why would we do this? One of the simplest, easiest things to think about is because it removes the Jewish lineage of the New Testament, right? King James hiding stuff, yeah. So, teaching a course in the New Testament, Hebrews through Jude, right? He began by introducing the book of Jacob. That's the author, Mark Wilson, right? He began by introducing the book of Jacob in his course, right? Also known as the book of James. But he introduced it to his class as the book of Jacob. And the students had no idea what he was talking about, the book of Jacob. They were like, huh? Book of Jacob? Or what, what, what New Testament book is that? No one knew what he was talking about. Students were confused until they learned that Jacob is the correct translation of the Greek name Jacobos. Kik, Kiko ate you. Welcome. Hi, Lloyd. So, yeah, that makes blaring sense. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Wolves. So, Jacob is the proper, the correct translation of the Greek name Jacobus. Jacobus, right? One student wrote later that knowing this turned my understanding of the writing upside down. Another student wrote that with the name change, the loss of of Jewish lineage of Jesus occurs. You lose the Jewish lineage of the family of Jesus. You lose the Jewish lineage of Jesus. So this was the this was the overwhelming impression taken from the students. I mean all other all other conspiracy theories aside, but this is the one thing. Right? Jacobus very similar to Jacob. Jacobus, yeah. All right. In Turkish it's Jakub again for Jacob. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. And much appreciated. So, you can see the overwhelming consensus is this is the name Jacob. Only in English does it change to James. And James has derived from to hide or to conceal. What are they concealing? My thinking is it is to conceal the Jewish lineage of Jesus, to cover that up, to paper that over, to, to not want him to be from a Jewish lineage. Right? So, okay. So, so do me a favor, time phaser. Let's find out on Google what year did John Wycliffe release his Bible with James in it, and what year did King James live? Okay, figure those two out. See if they lived at the same time. Go. In Portuguese, it's Yako, which would be short for Yakub, right? We've already had a different Portuguese translation on butchering the lineage of Jesus. Correct lightning. Okay, so moving on. Now, how did Yaakov become James? So, in the 13th century, the form of the Latin name, Jacobus, began its use in English. Okay, Jacobus, that's in the 1200s. If King James from the Bible was alive in the 1200s, please let me know. In the 14th century, okay, Protestant precursor John Wycliffe, and he was a Protestant precursor, he made his Bible translation from the Latin Vulgate. Now, you'll find dates between 1382 and 1395. Okay, so let's go with the early date for now, 1382. So he makes his Bible translation from the Latin Vulgate, 
And in the Latin, it's Jacobus. Okay, it's still Jacob, but that's from the Jacobus, right? He translated Jacobus as James, right? In both the Old and the New Testaments, Wycliffe used the name Jacob for the patriarch who wrestled with the angel. So hold on. He takes this particular instance of James, of Jacob, he calls it James, but in other instances, he leaves it as Jacob. He changes this one instance. Why would that be? That's a very unusual change. You change this in this particular instance, the brother of Jesus, but you leave the other one alone. You don't change that. You leave it as Jacob. It's the very same name. It's the same name in the Greek. Why would you change it? Change the one, but not the other. You, your guess is as good as mine. So William Tyndale's 1526 translation of the New Testament also used James. Okay. And in Genesis chapter 32, notice here, this is, right, this is the patriarch who wrestled with the angel, and Jacob went on his way. And by the way, I'm using here the King James Version, right? This is the King James Version of the Bible. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him, and when Jacob saw them, so they call him Jacob. Why did they not change his name to James? Very unusual. And in all future English translations, the name stuck, especially after 1611, when King James I, so there's your answer, okay, time phaser, 1611, King James I, and here we're looking at the 1300s. I, I kind of don't think King James was 230 years old. Probably not. So in all future English translations, the name stuck, especially after 1611, when King James I sponsored the translation that was then called the Authorized Version. Okay, so this comes before King James I. Let's look at a man called the Morning Star of the Reformation. Is there anyone else that was called the Morning Star? I believe Jesus may have been called the Morning Star. Someone mentioned that. But I know there's someone called the Morning Star in the Bible. Hillside, welcome. Are we discussing Bible translation? Bible mistranslation. Bible mistranslation. And what looks like deliberate Bible mistranslation in English. So, okay. So I do believe Jesus was called the Morning Star. That is the very weird question, Deduza. That's a very odd question. Lucifer. Yes, Shabitsky. <laughs> yes, exactly. Lucifer is known as the morning star. So he was known as the morning star of the Reformation. Okay, Satan. Exactly. Right? He's known as the morning star of the Reformation. So, uh, so he'll slide short version. The book of James is correctly, in all other languages, it's called the book of Jacob. Because it's Yaakov, or Yakub, which is Hebrew for Jacob. For some reason... In an early translation of the Bible into English, this this particular instance where you have James, this the brother of Jesus, is translated as James and not Jacob. And this has actually caused confusion in the archaeology world as well. And this has led to major issues in the archaeology world, it led to court cases and all sorts of confusion. But yeah. So John Wycliffe was an inspiration to Martin Luther. Okay? Wycliffe is sometimes called the morning star of the Reformation. And he's considered to be one of the most prominent contributors to Luther's Reformation. Right? Now, Wycliffe was born in 1330 and he died in 1384, almost exactly 100 years before Luther was born. Right? So Wycliffe was an English theologian and reformer who challenged the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. He emphasized the importance of Scripture. Now, I love it when, when the sources say things like he emphasized the importance of Scripture. No. What he did was he denied the authority of tradition. He denied the, the lineage, the apostolic lineage of the Catholic Church. And therefore, all that's left is the Bible. And of course, when they and since Martin Luther, as we all know, did say that every Christian is his own pope and his own church, Therefore, the translation of the Bible is left up to the individual, which is an entirely subjective enterprise. It is not the Bible that's authoritative. It is your personal interpretation of the Bible that is authoritative. Okay? So, Hall says, it is somewhat depressing how all these diverse subjects seem to all tie back to one another, almost demonic. Isn't that interesting that it's all of these things tie back together, Horse? I mean, isn't it odd how all of these things just come back Hello, Lloyd and everybody. Vegetable asbestos. Vegetal asbestos. Welcome, you servant. Welcome. You are late to the party. Go back to the beginning. Play it at 1.75 speed. All right. So he challenges the authority of the, of the church, right? And he says, only the Bible. That's that's great. But then what about the what about the church fathers that came prior? What was their interpretation? What do you learn from them? But no, 
when they say, no, we only look at this, it means we ignore the rest. It doesn't mean that, oh God, we're revering the Bible. No, because Luther was a butcher of the Bible. Remember, don't forget Luther, Martin Luther made edits to the Bible. He edited verses and he tried to edit the Bible. And if you look at the German Bible today, answer me this. Is it exactly the same as Luther's Bible, the Bible that Luther made? Or is it different? Right? So, he really denies tradition and elders. That's what it means. When we say we only... Yeah, we, they emphasize scripture, but edit it as well. So he, so the, yes, we believe in scripture after we changed it to suit our preferences. So when we've removed things and changed things and made the scripture say what we want, then we believe in the scripture. That's Martin Luther's position. So I'll leave it there for now. So his ideas influenced many other reformers, including Jan Hus, and I'll get into Jan Hus one day. Let's just say that's 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 gonna the word heretic is definitely gonna pop up, right? And he was burned at the stake for his views. Luther was also influenced by Wycliffe's ideas, particularly his emphasis on the authority of Scripture and his rejection of the Catholic Church's claim to authority. Right? While Wycliffe did not defend Martin Luther directly, okay, his ideas and teachings paved the way for Luther's Reformation. Well, he couldn't. Um, no, sorry, it could have been the other way around. So I might have made a typo. Martin Luther might not have defended Wycliffe directly. Sorry, I might have probably made a typo there. But his ideas paved the way. He was an early reformer that Luther took inspiration from, and Luther would have learned from him, right? He set an example. Okay? Okay, so Time Phaser says, Wycliffe's Bible released his Bible from 1382 to 1395, and King James was born in 1566. I guess my theory was 200 years off. Exactly. Let's just say I tend to talk after I've done the research, not before, right? So, yeah, so, okay, so... Yeah, this is new. I mean, I just finished it like shortly before, like literally two or three minutes before. So there's probably a couple of errors in this thing. Okay. Right. So ossuary or bone box. Wycliffe was judged as a heretic after his death. Okay. He was subsequently exhumed from his grave and his remains were burned. So what is lost by using James instead of Jacob? Just so we know what happened with the good old Wycliffe there. First, it has created awkwardness in academic writing because academically it is false this is wrong it's a mistake it is an error right so scholars providing a transliteration of james always in the greek indicate Jacobos, which even lay readers even non-greek speakers right even non-scholars know this is not the same when you look at Jacob or Jacobos, right Jacobus, you know it's not james we can tell the difference okay Wycliffe, that's a Gaelic name. I should look, yeah, I'm going to do Wycliffe one day and Tyndale, getting to that. So, Herschel Shanks, editor of the Biblical Archaeology Research Society, right, um, and the magazine, has noted that the reason that Israeli scholars fail to understand the significance of the Osiris that I mentioned in the very beginning was because they didn't connect James with Yaakov. Thank you very, very much, Time Phaser. Well, he says, everyone hit the like button. If you like this, yes, um, I would appreciate the support. I would appreciate you like, you share, you subscribe, tell people about this. 73 watching and only 32 likes, Nick says. Come on, everyone, hit that like button. Let's bring attention to the Lord's important work. Well, thank you very much, Nick, and uh, welcome to the channel. All right, so so this this caused confusion because in the Israeli, obviously, they see Jacob, they see Jacob. They go, they go who's James? Never heard of him. Who's that guy? All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> now, if real, this inscription is the earliest written reference to Jesus. Right, and this this mistake in the English caused confusion, and it eventually led to a five-year court case and a ton of money and time wasted. Right, so is the brother of Jesus inscription on the James Osiri a forgery? Right, so this is from the Biblical Archaeology Society. This is an article from 2017, and the bone box of James, the brother of Jesus, is back in the news as questions concerning its authenticity continue to plague the world-famous relic. The James Ossuary, as it's come to be known, is a limestone box that bears an Aramaic inscription. So tell me, <laughs> what is the name for James in the Aramaic, right? What do you think it's, do you think it's going to be James in the Aramaic? Or do you think it's going to be like Jacob, Jacobus, Jacobos? What is James in the Aramaic? So, someone please look that up and tell me, what is James in the original Aramaic? I'd love to know. So, it bears an Aramaic inscription reading, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Now, this is the common stance of translators. Because it's become embedded in the language to use the word James, they don't use Jacob. It's just how it is. It's, it's a fait accompli. It's done. Right? They won. So, controversy, including charges of forgery, have surrounded this ossuary since the 
Biblical Archaeology Review, first reported in the Artifact in 2002. The saga of the James Ossery culminated in 2012 with the acquittal of Israeli antiquities collector and owner Oded Golan in a seven-year forgery trial of the century. Okay, seven years, sorry, seven years, not even five years trial. So eventually they were acquitted. That's Yaakov. Thank you very much, Yaakov. It's not James. So why do they put that here as James? Do you understand the issue here? It, it's James everywhere. Sorry, it's, it's James everywhere in English, but it's Jacob. It, the original is Jacob. It's Yaakov, even in the Aramaic. Thank you. So although the famous James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus inscription, has been authenticated by world-class paleographers, not everyone is convinced that the authentication, that the script is that the inscription is authentic. And of course, academia doesn't want it to be authentic. Understand, academia does not want the Bible to be authentic. Absolutely, positively do not. Debate over Jesus' inscription rises again in this article. An American geologist says an inscription on an ancient burial box that refers to Jesus could be authentic after all. In fact, if you read the article, uh, it's in uh, it's NBC News. Actually, let me just go find the article for you. Let me just go find the article and I'll bring this up here. But the article itself is, I think, very much more positive than the headline reads. Uh, so I'll go look at this. Okay. And it says here, an American geologist. No, yes, exactly. The, um, the article itself is far more positive. An American geologist has rebutted an Israeli analyst that cast doubt on the authenticity of an inscription naming Jesus on an ancient burial box. Okay. So, so yeah, this guy says no. Okay. So this, this American archaeologist goes, the article is very positive towards this. The article is very positive. But while we're here, let's have, let's have a look at this. Jacob. So if you go to Etim Online, the online etymology dictionary, right? So if we go to the online etymology dictionary, you'll see here proper name, blah, blah, from Latin, Jacobus, Greek, Jacobus, Hebrew, Jacob, Giacomo. Okay. So you have Iago, blah, Italian, Giacomo, and James. Contracted Spanish Jaime from the old French Jacques from a diminutive of Jacobus. So Jacques is from Jacobus, see Jack. Okay, that's all great and well. Then you have Jack and it leads back to James and it says from Latin Jacobus, see Jacob. Fancy, it just keeps coming back to Jacob. It keeps going around in circles and coming back to Jacob. Right, let's have a look here. Jem. Jem, James, from the Hebrew, Jacob, Jacob. Isn't that odd? From the late Latin, Jacobus. From the Greek, Jacobus, meaning Yaakov, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. Do you, see, do you understand how this keeps coming back? And for some reason in English, these scholars in the beginning, these translators, and I don't think, I mean, basically, remember, uh, Wycliffe, Tyndale, bad scholars, heretics. Why would I trust them, given what they've done here? Okay. So no wonder some Luthers said that Jesus had a biological brother and Mary is not a virgin. Yes, so I haven't trusted NBC News. Yeah, but look, they're just reporting on the scholars' words. Okay, so I mean, I, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily going to be that um, controversial. It's just reports saying this guy said. Okay, um, I don't know what your name is in the Hebrew, dude. I seriously have no idea. If someone could help me out here, uh, this name here, I have no idea what it is. He says, never understood the whole idea of translating names. What's the point if the whole meaning is lost? Maybe the point was to lose the meaning. Maybe the whole point was to lose the meaning. Understand? What if that certain languages tend to do that, but Hungarian used to do that. Okay. So, and let's go back here. Let's go to Jaime. If you go to Jaime on Etim Online, it takes you to, surprise, surprise, to Jacob. Jaime, James, goes back to Jacob. The first entry is Jacob. And it takes us back to Giacomo, Jaime, Jacobus. Understand? And James goes back to late Latin, Jacobus, which is from the Latin, Jacobus, back to Jacob. Do you understand how this thing just comes back in circles and comes back to Jacob? It, it constantly comes back to Jacob. It is Jacob. It is not James. Okay? So let's move on. So James' ancestral lineage is lost. It loses James's ancestral lineage. It disconnects him from Jesus. It disconnects him from the church. Do you understand? This would seem to be deliberate. Why? Because from a Protestant point of view, you don't want the Pope. You don't want the early church fathers to have authority. You want to make all sorts of negative claims. So now you need to disconnect authority in any way that you can. Understand that. So hopefully you guys, I mean, this, this is what I'm fine. This is what I'm saying. These are my thoughts. But this is what happens. This is the end result. 
what is the real reason for William Tyndale's death? He insulted the king. <laughs> <laughs> I think he said the king's wife was ugly or something like that. Um, but yeah, I've got the notes on Tyndale. I've got the notes on Tyndale. It's not the common story. It's it's trust me. Whatever the common story is, it's it's, it's not that. Uh, William Tyndale pissed off the king, and he he got his ass killed for that. Let's just say when you call the king's wife ugly, expect to die. Right. So it was something like that. I have the notes. I'm not going to go to them now. Okay. Let's not go there right now. Okay, that's going to distract me. Let's look at Genesis 29, 18 to 29, 30. Again, King James Version, the King James Version of the Bible. And Jacob loved Rachel. It's not James. That's the very same word in the Greek. Why would they not change it? It's the same word in the Hebrew. Why would they not change it to James? They, so only in that instance, to, to, make, to remove James as leader of the church, so that you can say the church, well, you know, the early church had no leader. There was no pope. Everyone was equal, just like communists, good old socialists, right? So that's my thinking on that. Okay, so James's ancestral lineage is lost. So, okay, as we've already noticed, his name is Ernesto. <laughs> yes. In Matthew's genealogy, we'll learn that Joseph's father was named Jacob. Okay, that's fascinating. That's in Matthew 1, verse 16. Okay, so they call him Jacob. Why did they not call him James? And his family tree included the patriarch, Jacob, not James, to sow confusion and doubt. Yes, horse, that would make perfect sense. It's an assault on the supremacy of the Catholic Church, on the, on the authority of the Catholic Church, on the historicity and lineage of the Catholic Church. Understand? But not just that, on the early church, so that you can now implement your own church to replace them, to supplant them. Because don't forget, Jacob, the word Jacob also means to supplant. Right, So maybe there's a play on the idea here, play on the words. James means to hide or conceal, but Jacob means to supplant. So th this could be a symbolic meaning within names, right, from these. Because one day I will do Tyndall and Wycliffe, but those are, those are far more complex stories than, than are typically understood. So James was named after his grandfather because they had three Jacobs in a row. Grandfather, father, son. All of them called Jacob, except when his name got translated badly as James. So Ben Witherington writes, it is clear that the family of James was proud of its patriarchal heritage because they came from the patriarch Jacob who wrestled the angel. So they wanted to be associated with the Jacob that wrestled the angel that met God. Do you understand? This was important to them. The name Jacob was very important to them. So Jacob was the third Jacob in the family. So open a window. It's about a billion degrees here in Poland right now. So, third, James's Jewish cultural background is minimized. So, question, is this making sense so far? I Look, I do understand I make very blunt statements. I put together my story, I present my evidence, and I make very blunt statements. I don't give you wishy-washy answers. If I don't know, I don't know, and I'll say that. But I don't give you like, well, you know, it, it could be left, but it could also be right. But, you know, you know, it could be one, maybe it's 37 and a half, it could be 33.2, it could be minus 100. I try to give you very clear answers because I'm telling you this is what I think. Right. Does this make sense to you? Is this logical? Is this rational? Does the evidence stack up? So give me a one or give me your comments, but I would just like to know. I have a question out of topic for later. Okay, sure. Uh, I'll be online tomorrow. I should be online tomorrow with Thunderous to finish the story of Hitler and Christianity, which I believe is the definitive, the definitive series on the fact that Hitler was absolutely positively not a Christian. <clears throat> um, horse says one so do the rest of you agree does this make sense am I just waffling am I just throwing random things together or does this make a coherent logical historical narrative time phases says it makes sense to me right so someone is up to no good that's my thinking right and they, this was deliberate it was not an accident FP says yes thank you very much so look do, don't say it because because you want to be nice to me but but I'm, I'm hoping does this sound rational right and I'm hoping it is because it is rational so, Tal Ilan, and also an Israeli archaeologist or something, scientist, he identifies Jacob as the 15th most popular name in Palestine in antiquity, with 18 known persons carrying it. Right? So, it's a popular name, well-known name. It's not an accident. So, it's not like it's a rare name. It's hard to translate. Including both the Eastern and Western diasporas, Jacob was the third most popular Jewish name with 74 occurrences. 74. Okay? So, it's the third most popular Jewish name. Why? So, how did Jacob become James? That's such an odd thing, if he's that important within the, within the Bible. So, remember, they follow the Bible only 
after they made the changes to the Bible that suits their preferences. Remember that. So it minimizes the Jewish heritage of the New Testament. Okay, so fourth, the Jewish literary heritage is muddled. So as usual, it is born out of a not-so-friendly attitude towards the Jews. Thank you, Joel Thomas, for making that conclusion. Yes. Now, I can't find any direct evidence regarding Wycliffe and his views on Jews. I, I can't find anything that says he said nice things, but I can't find anything that says he said bad things. But let's just say I've only just started looking, so you never know what we'll find, right? But yeah, let's just say, yeah, let's just say, might well be something to do with that. So it is rational and unfortunately fits human nature perfectly. And you as a former law enforcement officer, I mean, you'll understand human nature, right? Uh, you've had to go hard head to head with it at a high speed, I'm pretty sure. So, right, under conditions of hazard. So you have to read things well. So the Jewish literary heritage is muddled. The book of Jacob is addressed to the 12 tribes in the diaspora, James 1.1, 1, 1, and full of references and allusions to the Torah and wisdom literature of the Jewish Bible. So it's a very, very Jewish New Testament book, right? So, so Christians, okay, so scholars consider James the most Jewish book in the New Testament. It is a bit like the New Testament book of Proverbs. So it's like the book of Proverbs for the New Testament. So it is a very Jewish flavor. So why would you want to strip away his name from that to remove the Jewish heritage? Understand, that's a really odd thing to do. It has strong emphasis. Now, maybe here's where we are. Uh, maybe here's where the clue starts to start to really hit us in the face. It has strong emphasis on practical ethical teachings. It uses Jewish wisdom literature and it focuses on the importance of works and deeds. Okay, I'll repeat that. It it focuses on the importance of works and deeds to attain salvation, not works and deeds as a proof of salvation, but works and deeds required to earn salvation. Okay? I'm not going to get into a long theological debate here, but so that's not where this is going, but let's just leave it at that. Okay? In the Christian faith, it addresses a predominantly Jewish audience and incorporates Jewish traditions and teachings. The book emphasizes the importance of actions and practical living as evidence of genuine faith. So in James 2.17, it is stated, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, of course, I've read through Luther's works. I've been reading a lot of Luther's works lately. And man, I've been reading theologians gushing about it, like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. You know, it's, it's just amazing. It's so, oh, <laughs> I'm going to cry. Seriously, it's like, just stop, right? So, of course, they want to translate this not Literally, as it stands on the page, they've got to go and translate it in a, well, they've got to, let's just say they've got to do eisegesis. They've got to read into it what they want out of it, right? So now, the genre of James is considered to be a diaspora letter, very similar to Jeremiah 29, 1-23, and the apocryphal works, the epistle of Jeremiah, 2 Maccabees, 1, 1-2 and 18, and 2 Apocalypse of Baruch, 78-86. So it's got a similar flavor. So understand, we also know that Martin Luther took great exception to James, right? And yeah, because of its Jewish nature, Martin Luther absolutely positively hated Jews. And don't tell me 20 years before Martin Luther said nice things about Jews, because 20 years later, he said we should have killed them all. Okay, and no, I'm not incorrectly stating that. Some reading is pure agony. <laughs> Trust me, when you read through this stuff several hours a day, horse, it is painful. You know, at least it's it's funny. At least it's humorous in a way because, because man, reading the Sharia is disgusting. It is filthy. It makes me feel like I want to puke. At least this just, this is just funny sometimes. So they'll say, well, faith is dead. So anyway, so anyway, but some of the translations of this, even so faith, if it hath not works is dead being alone. So they say, well, you know, faith is dead. So what has to happen is grace has to come down and then, and they get a whole backwards theology. But that's my reading of the, the, um, of the formula of concord and so on okay so yeah so he says here look faith is dead if you don't work you have to work work brings faith and of course luther turns it around swaps it around the other way okay so hebrew is not the original language though hebrew is actually derived from an older language from the canaanite and um, that comes from like the babylonian languages and stuff so i've discussed that before um it's not the very oldest it actually there's languages before that uh, Protestant believer says, yeah, to take a bath after reading a chapter of Reliance of the Traveler. Yeah, it made me sick. I've sat here. 
you have no idea how many hours uh, I've sat and I mean reading this stuff it's just it's just makes me filthy I've had to go and scrub my brain because it's disgusting okay in Thai thank you enough sus in Thai Jacob is Jakob James is Jakob Jakob and yeah thank, thank you so that's interesting there are differences even in Thai so Martin Luther so this quote St. James is wrong okay Luther actually said that Luther wrote on his note, in his notes on Saint on James, he said James is wrong. Emeritic, that's it. Yeah. Can you make something about Sirat's view of Muhammad? I have. Um, go to my um, go to my series, um, La Muhammad You Never Knew. I have like two parts on that. Where I go through the Sira where they make Muhammad into Jesus. They make him into someone who was created from the same essence of God before the earth was made, and the earth was made for Muhammad. Go go look through that. The Muhammad You Never Knew. I, I do have a series on that. Two parts. St. James is wrong, okay? And that's what Luther said. So Martin Luther famously disagreed with James 2.24, amongst others. Okay, not, not only that, other things too. Which says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So the only place that the words faith alone appears in the Bible, right? The only place where the words faith alone appear in the Bible, it is preceded by not by faith alone. <clears throat> so this, this verse contradicted Martin Luther. So this essay is the only place where the words faith and alone are together, and it's preceded by not, by faith alone. This verse utterly contradicted Martin Luther, and Martin Luther was not happy because the Bible didn't say what he wanted it to say. So Luther wrote, James is wrong. The, literally, this on that verse, Martin Luther wrote, James is wrong. Now, I'd like to ask you, as a Protestant, who of you agrees that James is wrong? Please write your name in the comments. I'd like to know who of you agrees that St. James is wrong. That those, are Martin, those are Martin Luther's direct words. James is wrong. Who of you is going to read St. Peter and say, St. Peter is wrong? Okay. Who's going to read Luke, Matthew, Mark? Take your pick. So who agrees with Luther here? Who, who is going to defend Martin Luther and say, Luther is right. James is wrong. Please let me know. Okay, let me know. Drop your name down and says, no, Luther is right. James is wrong. Who agrees with Martin Luther? Please, I'd love to know. So Luther, <clears throat> let's see what someone says. I'm fairly certain Satan thought God was wrong in a similar fashion. Yes, of course. Um, Eva says, that story of Amina giving birth to Mo with the light from her VV is <laughs> so great that it reached Bastra. Stolen story of Christianity. Okay, I didn't know that. I need to look that up. Let me know in the chat, in the comments later, if you can find where you found that. Time phase says a Protestant that did not agree with crap Luther wrote. Yeah, but he wrote a lot of crap, and I'm going to be digging through all of that crap. He he wrote nothing but crap, as far as I can tell. Uh, this is quite shocking. Vegetal asbestos. Yes, I'll be going through all that. I'll be ta I'll be tackling all that stuff Luther wrote. Yeah, it's uh, Luther's a coward. Obviously, James is wrong. Jacob is right. Yes, well, yeah, Jacob is correct. James is wrong. <laughs> I agree with I agree with Luther as with Muhammad. <laughs> Luther is wrong. Thank you. But Lloyd, I thought the book of James was written by a Jew and never even knew a Christian, not James. Yes. Yes. Martin Luther also said some Jew wrote James. Some Jew wrote it who didn't know any Christians. Okay. So, yeah. So, let me continue before I get too sidetracked. Thank you. Okay. So, Luther emphasized. So, Luther, who was the key figure in the Protestant Reformation, and please don't lie to me. Do not lie to me because that just makes me do research. When you lie to me, all it does is I go, okay, you're a liar, but now I know what arguments you use, what nonsense arguments you use, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to go do all the research to prove you the liar that you are. I'm going to go do all of the research. So the next time you lie to me, I'm going to be able to prove to you with detail upon detail upon detail, facts upon facts upon facts with the reams of paper that you are not only wrong, but dishonest. Okay. But that's fine. Go ahead and lie because that only gives me reason to prove you wrong, right? To do research. So Vegetal says, I'm Orthodox and I grew up in communism. I had no clue there's such a thing as Protestants growing up. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, your works in this is a byproduct of your faith. No works in your faith is fake. Martin Luther didn't want the book of James in the canon, which was dead wrong. Yes. So this is quite surprising. Luther got in his way and James, Hebrews, not only four books, he wanted to get rid of like four books, Revelation and another one, um, James, Hebrews, Revelation and, and a fourth one. And then also he was making edits to verses. I still need to look into that. I've got some notes I need to start digging through. But man, it's thousands of pages. Believe me, it is thousands of pages. I mean, I don't mean like 1,000. I mean thousands and thousands I've got to dig through to find those. <clears throat> 
Phil Watts, thank you for subscribing. Okay, so Luther is the key figure in the Protestant Reformation. I've had I've had someone who constantly comes in, Jude, pro probably Jude, yes, Joshua, it might well be Jude. Yeah, you wanted to toss them all out. He stuck in, eventually he stuck them in his Bible, in the back of the Bible, in an index, to hopefully hoping people would forget about it. The current German Bible, to my knowledge, is back to the normal Orthodox way of doing it. Whereas Luther's Bible, yeah, the Protestants, the, the even the Lutherans looked at them and went, yeah, that's nonsense, let's, let's uh, sweep that under the rug. Let's all forget about that and go back to the way it should have been. Crazy for shame. Yes, Rachel, that is crazy for shame. Titus. Uh, I'm not sure if it was Titus. I've got the name somewhere. So, anywho, so people keep telling me Luther was not the most important figure. In fact, Luther was a minor figure in the Reformation. Look, that's crap. Okay. Um, and then said, well, if you take Luther away, who do you have left? You've got Calvin. And Calvin, Calvin's not going to look pretty when I'm done with him either. Who do you got? Who do you have then? Okay. Who do you have then? What will you say? You know, so yeah, you're going to have some issues. They call themselves Lutherans. That's sad enough. Yes. Anyway, so the key figure in the Protestant Reformation is Martin Luther. Please don't tell me otherwise. He strongly emphasized the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, known as sola fide. He believed that salvation is received only through faith apart from works or deeds. Okay, we'll talk about that in at length in an, at another time. I have a bunch of notes on that. I'm not ready to talk about that now. So Luther struggled with the inclusion of James in the New Testament canon due to its contradiction with his claim of justification by faith alone without works. So unbelievable. How can he redefine what the Holy Spirit inspired a literal follower of Jesus to write? Yes, Luther is definitely cooking in hell. And personally, that's what I believe too. I don't even believe Luther was a Christian at the end of his life. He may have started as one. I don't believe he ended as one. So yes, yes, Luther believed in the Bible after he made the changes to it that he wanted. So it would say what he wanted it to say. Ultimately, Luther considered James, and this is very mild, this is very mild criticism of his, a straw epistle. You know, a house built on straw, in comparison to the writings of Paul, whom he saw as more aligned with his theological views. And he had this whole idea of, of these books are the better books, and then you got the weaker books, and you got the horrible books here on the bottom, and James goes on the bottom tier, because don't really, yeah, James, okay, fine. Okay, so he had this, so he rearranged the Bible to suit him, or to ignore those, read these, these, these ones say what I want. So, in errant scripture, except for James and a bunch of other books. So, for in matters of faith, Luther, Luther writes, every Christian is his own pope and church, okay? And he cannot hold or observe anything that may in any way endanger the sincerity of his faith. Typos again. Okay, my bad. Right. <clears throat> Lutherans know that it's the same for the reform positions. Ah, so hold on. Deeply Hidden says, regarding what you said earlier about some differences between the Book of Concord and Luther's writings, Lutherans know that it's the same for the reform positions, Westminster Synod of Dort. I need to go through that. I haven't looked through that yet. Uh, I've been reading through the, the formula of Concord. So I've been doing that in the German and the English. And even some of the translations, I'm like, that's why I'm looking at the German and trying to go for earlier translations, because sometimes I don't trust the translations into English. So the name Lutheran and Calvinist doesn't mean that they believe everything. Yeah, but here's the thing. To say you're Catholic, but you believe Buddhism and you pick and mix. I mean, dude, then why are you Lutheran? Understand, you obviously believe some things that are strictly Lutheran doctrine. You've obviously taken some core ideas. But here's the thing, it's like atheists. When you tell an atheist, look, blah, 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 but atheists, and they go, well, you know, I'm actually a raxillated, non-pixelated mono-atheist as opposed to the de-raxillated, unpixelated, you know, purple blue atheists and and actually no no i'm i'm a i'm a red green purple atheist not like those atheists we're completely different we have an extra comma okay so sorry that that that, that just allows them to to baffle you with bs which is french for basically science okay so sorry own it what do you believe? Because if you're like, well, you know, I believe this now, but if you embarrass me, I believe that, then you are just a Protestant Abdul. Because Abduls do that, and if Protestants are going to do that, yes, I will call you a Protestant Abdul, because it is Abdulism for Protestants. Prove me wrong. So Luther and Calvin were very wrong, but it's much better to critique their official confessions. Westminster, when I when I critiqued the Westminster confession of faith i was told well lord you know actually n nobody believes that you know no one actually no one actually uses that you know it's not it's not really relevant you know and um, and then it's been edited by every other church does a pick and mix on it i don't like this i'm changing that changing that sentence ripping out this uh paragraph i mean like seriously like like honestly it's just like <laughs> i seriously don't want to swear but it's so hard but it's like you just make this crap up as you go it's like Honestly, how is that how is that standing on a firm foundation if you make it up as you go along? 
seriously, how do I take you seriously? So, Christine Maria said there are many German translations out there, and one of them is Luther, but the most accurate ones are the Eberfeld and the Schlachted translation. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. You know, I'm going to, I'm just going to make a note of that. I'm going to drop it in here for later. Okay, so any comments that I have missed? As I said, Luther had a religion in mind and he started changing stuff to make the Bible fit to this theology. And that, that's the conclusion I am coming to as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, your works. Okay, so we've, okay, I think I've caught up with the comments. Okay, yeah, so Thunderclap says, ultimately blasphemy trying to remove and redefine and nullify God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, okay, so he writes us, every Christian is own Pope. If you're your own Pope, you are your own scriptural authority, which means you will disagree with the guy next to you. And that's why if you, if everyone is his own Pope and his own church, then you are going to have no agreement. Martin Luther was also influenced by William of Ockham. Yes, I have done work on William of Ockham. And yes, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. I just haven't had a chance to talk about him. I've got to slot him into the right place. So we're going to be talking about scholasticism because what's odd is I spoke yesterday with a guy who claimed to be a Catholic. And he's definitely a Protestant Catholic because he's certainly not a Catholic Catholic. And um, he was telling me about pre predestination and um, the Catholic Church as identical, effectively predestination to Lutheranism and Calvinism and... Okay, fine, whatever. I just spent hours of my life reading Luther, <laughs> reading Luther's works, reading the Formula of Concord, reading Calvin's crap, and um, and like I'm like, okay, man, like, it's not even worth having a conversation. He's a Protestant Catholic, yes, obviously. I don't. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Now these are the words of Martin Luther. So I'm going to be quoting you the words of Martin Luther himself, or Martin Luther for. All right. Let us banish this epistle, that's James, from this university, for it is worthless. This is uh, Württemberg, right? Let us banish the epistle of James from this university, for it is worthless. He calls James worthless. It has no syllable about Christ, not even naming him except once at the beginning. I think it was written by some Jew who had heard of Christians, but hadn't joined them. Right? James had learned that the Christians insisted strongly on faith in Christ, and so he said to himself, well, you need to contradict them. You must take issue with them and speak only of works. And so he does. So he says that the book of James was a fraud written by some Jew to undermine the idea of faith alone, which Luther believed in. And he wrote about works specifically to destroy the Christian faith. And this book is a fraud. Now, as a Protestant, these are the words of Luther. I am not making this up. Who of you agrees that the book of James, the brother of Jesus, was a fraud written by some Jew to undermine the Christians? Who agrees with Luther here? This is what Luther thought. Do you see now why the Lutheran church wants to sweep this under the rug, you know, and forget about it and why they've changed their doctrine and they're not actually following Luther very much because even they realized the man was was a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so he says here, moreover, James has no order nor method. He says that the book of James is a random jumble. Now he speaks of clothes, now of anger, wrath, jumping from one topic to another, disjointed jumble. Have I heard the Lutheran sprinkle creed, the sparkle creed, you mean, the sparkle creed? Oh yeah, that was, I saw it today. I watched the whole thing. It is... Makes you want to puke, doesn't it? But yeah, go look up the Sparkle Creed. Um, the Sparkle Creed, this Lutheran church that was, Jesus had two fathers. See, even Jesus was LGBT because Jesus had two fathers. He proceeded from two fathers. God the Father and the Holy Spirit, because just like LGBT children can have two fathers, so Jesus had two fathers, and God is LGBT, God loves, okay, whatever, okay. Yes, it's even worse than that. Non-binary God, yeah. God is non-binary, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Luther, I love that malice. <laughs> that was funny. That was very funny. I love that malice. Thank you. Okay. For as, he, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And now he criticizes it. Okay, so he says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, because if your spirit leaves your body, your matter, the flesh, is dead, right? You have, you have died because your soul has left your body. So faith without works is dead also, okay? 
So he's saying works is required for faith to have meaning, to have life. And he says here, Mary, mother of God, he compares faith to the body when it should rather be compared to the soul. The ancients, and he says the early church fathers and other theologians before him, saw all this and did not consider the epistle of James canonical. In other words, they thought it did not belong in the Bible. And therefore, Luther wanted to throw it into the oven and burn it. He wanted it thrown out of his college. He wanted it removed from the Bible. He couldn't get it done. He couldn't make it happen. But yes. Okay, so even he says here, but James 1 verse 6, he says, this is the only good place in the whole, in the whole book. <laughs> Are the table talks chronological? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I haven't had to look at it those way, but, but a lot of people go like, but Luther said some nice things in 1503, you know, and the stuff he said in 1543, you know, it's like that, that, it's because they're trying to, but Luther also said this, yeah, that was like 50 years prior. Okay, so the stuff he said later was more important because it abrogated the stuff that said earlier. Rusty. Okay, so let's have a look at the life and letters of Martin Luther. He says, okay, this is the only good place in the whole epistle. So James 1 verse 6, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. This is the only good verse. He says that's the only good verse. And he says, receiveth meekness, the engrafted word, okay? Others engrafted it. This is not James. And he says, someone else put this verse into the book of James. Someone else wrote this. Okay, and he says, what a chaos. And he says, you see then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And Luther writes, that is false. He says, this is false. He disagrees. So please, Protestants, when you're going to disagree with me about what James meant and what Luther meant, you're wrong. Bluntly, you're wrong. This clarifies James means exactly what he says and Luther contradicts him. Now, your theology, my theology... Not that I believe that crap anymore, but clearly it's wrong because Luther contradicts James, right? Now, do you stand with James, Scripture, because we go by Scripture alone? Do you go by Scripture or do you go by Luther, this lying fat pig? Are we sure he could read well? Um, I, I guess so. I'm from Africa. If I can read, so could Luther, I guess. Luther was a globalist and communist of his time. I'd kind of half agree with that. Yeah, it kind of kind of leans in that direction. He was definitely for the power of the state. Um, so, Vegetal says, yeah, most Protestants don't know these details, so they act towards Luther like Muslims act towards Muhammad. And, and that, I, sadly, I believe is true. Calvin is even worse, probably. This is Luther's works, okay? So, Luther decided that James was wrong, okay? This is Luther's works, volume 54, table talk. Luther, it says here in the translation, Luther has a low opinion of the epistles of James. Okay, this is summer of fall, 1542, number 5443. He says we should throw the epistle of James out of the school. It doesn't amount to much. I maintain that some Jew wrote it who probably heard about Christians, but never encountered any. He thought, wait a moment, I'll oppose them and urge works alone. This he did. So you understand, James is saying works. Now look, there are verses that talk about um, faith. There are verses that talk about works clearly we can't go like luther and calvin well you know we're going to ignore these verses and throw them out we're not even going to look at them we, we don't like them we are completely and utterly ignoring them focusing just on these and that's our theology that is i'm sorry that is not only wrong that is that is egregiously wrong so and this is what they did i hope this makes clear so let me move on and this is oddly enough also within his table talks you were a pope and didn't even know it. Yes, eventually you are a pope. The whole James thing's really confused me when I encountered it. As it seems to be only an English thing. In German, it's always Jacobus. In my native language, it was Jacob. Thank you, yes. Um, they're still based on Luther and Calvin, but just more thought out. Obviously, I think they're still wrong. Look, when you read the the formula of Concord, it's it's, it's a non-answer. When you when you look at free will, it's a non-answer. It's a, it's, a, it's a fancy word game. It's a word puzzle. It's designed to confuse, not to clarify. And it's a non-answer. I mean, I, I spent hours on it. Just trying to understand that section, just on free will. And it, it's a non-answer. You it, you get nowhere. When you try to get a clear answer, it's like a politician talking to you. Just You just don't get to a yes or a no. It's clearly a no because you, here's a rule. If you're not being told yes, you are being told no. Until someone tells you yes, they are telling you no. And there that, that, whole, that whole concord thing is a non-answer. Um, Nick says, very harsh words, Protestantism is humanist Gnosticism cloaked in Christian ideology. They worship an intellect and understanding rather than submit to the truth. And I, I would sadly have to agree with you. 
Me too, until Lloyd posted Luther's writings. Lightning. Okay, so yeah. Uh, the whole James thing, so they're still based. Let me see, did I miss anything? The theology added distinctions. This is where all the later confessions come from. Okay. I'm not denying that Lutherans don't have most of the same beliefs as Luther, but these early Protestants obviously didn't have a much developed theology. Later Protestants tried to systematize, but that is correct. That is actually correct. Calvin had a much more systematic theology than Luther did. Luther just wrote like 1,800 pages a year, so the man was writing a pile of stuff. I mean, the, 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 the works here, if you look at this, I mean, this was volume 54. There's like 58 volumes of this stuff. Okay, and they run to hundreds of pages. I mean, man, that's a lot to get through. It's not exactly an afternoon's work, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Dr. Forst and Dr. Ziegler conferred with us, that's Luther, about our version of the Bible, about my version of the Bible. So he's writing about my version of the Bible and gave us much help. I gave them three rules. The Bible speaks and teaches of God works. Of this, there is no doubt. Okay, thanks, Luther. But these works are divided into three classes, the home, the state, and the church. So Luther divided the Bible into the home, the state, and the church. Well, thank you very much, Time Phaser. Uh, I'd have to go now. Yeah, sorry, I have two more slides left after this, but sure, you can catch up soon. Uh, what I've heard about the Book of Concord and Predestination is confusing. No, it's, it doesn't give an answer. I, have, I spent hours on it today, hours, okay, trying to pick apart the logic. It, it doesn't, it just goes in circles. It literally goes in circles. It does not give you an answer. It gives you gobbledygook. If you've listened to R.C. Sproul speak, holy moly, that man just talks in circles. Fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> they want to affirm both. Exactly. They affirm both positions and they affirm nothing. Okay. So, anyway, so if a saying does not fit the church, let us place it in whichever of the other classes it best suits. So, if he thinks that a saying is not churchly, then it goes into the home. Or the state. Who has ever heard of this three-way division of the Bible into home, church, and state? Has anyone ever heard of that? I never, until I read this like two weeks ago, I'd never heard of this. Okay. Um, Vegetal asbestos says you cannot affirm both without breaking the law of non-contradiction. Yes. Thank you for it. I was, I, I did a show recently on scholasticism and Calvin, and I'm going to be talking about that. We need to do a talk on logic because yes, it, Protestant Protestant theology violates the law of non-contradiction. It utterly violates it. And Luther was very much, I'm not going to say he said reason as a whole, because I'm still trying to source where exactly he said that, or if he even did. It seems he didn't. That seems to be a paraphrase of his ideas. But I've been finding the specific quotations he makes, and I've been tracking those down, and I have a bunch so far. And Luther didn't like intellect. He didn't like rationality. He didn't like logic. He was all about the feelings and the voices. Okay, so moving on. <clears throat> When there is doubt about the words or construction, we must choose the sense, saving the grammar, which agrees with the New Testament. So the sense, the feeling of it, as opposed to what it actually says, right? If a sentence is repugnant to the whole of Scripture, remember his interpretation of Scripture, we must simply throw it away. Ah, so if a sentence in the Bible is repugnant to Luther's view of the Bible, we must throw it away, for the rabbis have corrupted the whole text. So, okay, who of you agrees with Luther here that the rabbis have corrupted the Bible? And then if a verse, if you don't like a verse, you must throw it away. Why do you think Luther wanted to throw James away? Because, well, it was repugnant to the whole of Scripture. You see, I don't like this because the rabbis have corrupted the text. Do you see how these ideas fit together now? Does that make sense, everyone? Give me a one in the chat if this makes sense to you. I think we're on a five-second delay or a four-second delay. Please let me know if this sentence in red makes sense. Now you see why he wanted to throw away James. This is not the Bible. This is his interpretation of the Bible. I don't like that. It goes. Thank you. <clears throat> so, yeah, thank you very much, guys. It's Joel, Rusty, Eva, Nick, Protestant, Daryl. James is so full of wisdom. Faith with works is a muscle fulfilling life. It makes sense. Luther is like a Pharisee or Sadducee. Yes, that sounds familiar. Carol M., thank you. It's like Muslims and corruption of scripture. Exactly. He's making the same claims Muslims do about the Bible. It's like, it boggles my mind. I come from a family of priests, right? I, I grew up in the church. I come from a family of highly trained theologians, trained at King's College in London, right? I have a bishop in the family. Understand? So, so I just assumed certain things. And also, I, was always, I always wondered why my family didn't want to talk about the Catholic Church, why they didn't want to talk about Catholic doctrine. Now I know. Understand? Now that I've started reading this myself, I'm like, th this, this sounds... Too Muslim to me. This is what this is what Muslims say about the scriptures. Um, so Luther, Rusty says, so Luther was a sort of semi marcion who took out the Old Testament and the non-Pauline epistles because he was anti-Jewish. He was extremely anti-Jewish. That is correct. 
Um, so time phaser, yeah, I hope you're having a good time, but uh, thanks for stopping by earlier. Uh, we'll catch up with you later when you get back to this last section. Um, why did Martin Lucifer ever claim to be a Christian? Uh, yeah, that's a story we'll get into another time. But he wanted to, so everyone says, remember there was that storm and he was caught in the storm. He thought he was going to die. So according to new archaeology from the 2012 to the 2015 or something, or 2008 to 2012, something like that, apparently that story is not true, right? Where it was lightning and lightning hit a tree and he said, God, if I don't die in the storm, I will join the church, become a monk. Apparently the story, the truth is, and apparently he writes in his notes that that wasn't true. What happened was his family wanted him to marry someone. He didn't want to get married. So he became a monk because a monk can't get married. So he ran off to the church to, to spite his parents to get away from the marriage. And then afterwards he uh, decided to leave the, 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 the church because he wanted to get married. So he ran away from a marriage. Yeah, apparently that's, I, I still need to get into that, but that's apparently the story. So I need to get into all of that in the future. Okay, so for these reasons, changing English translations of James to Jacob makes a lot of sense. I hope it makes a lot of sense to you. Now, we have adapted a number of name changes. Name changes are not unusual in English. Bombay to Mumbai, Peking to Beijing, Burma to Myanmar, Rhodesia to Zimbabwe, right? Uh, most recently, Pretoria and Johannesburg, oh my god, to Kapepwestan, and um, yeah, sorry, let me not use those jokes. So these changes were soon incorporated by the media as well as in subsequent editions of geographical and historical books. So we do make changes. Making such, an, such a word adjustment, onomastic word adjustment, need not be too difficult in religious circles either. It should be very easy to correct the error. This is an error. Hopefully you can see this is a mistake, a deliberate mistake, right? Um, King Henry creates a whole new church because he had marital issues. Yeah, he wanted to, yeah, we all know why he wanted to, yeah, so. But can such a switch be made practically? Now, this is a genuine question. This is this is taken from the article by, um, by Mark Wilson. Biblical scholars and publishers would need to agree that continued use of James is linguistically indefensible, and it is indefensible, and it is culturally misleading, and it is deliberately, I believe, culturally misleading. Most difficult to change would be the Bible translations, which are very conservative. Okay, because Bible translations, typically, you don't just randomly do things. You've got to be very careful how you translate them. Okay. Um, Christine Maria, so Luther was fed up with the Roman Catholic Church because everything was in Latin and normal people would not be able to understand the Bible and the services. That's why I wanted to. Christine, is that true? Is that really 100% true? If we can find one example, one example of something prior to Luther that was a Bible in German, because everyone says Luther was the first guy to put a Bible into German. Well, maybe that's not true. What if that's not true? What if that's the pretext that is given? Because, because I mean, the, the standard story is we hate the Catholic Church, right? We have to lie about it. And Luther said, lie about the, lie about the Catholic Church because that's what we do. Luther said those things. He, he instructed his people to lie. Luther said, I will lie, you lie, let's all lie about the Catholic Church. And these old pretexts are getting a little old because historically they don't stand up, right? So, now most difficult to change would be Bible translations, which are very conservative, of course. Now, let's go on here. In Matthew 4.21 from the Codex Sinaiticus, the name Jacob is given the interpretation James. In Mark 5.37 from the Codex Sinaiticus, the on ending that follows the first instance is the accusative ending, and the oi ending of the second is the genitive. Now, here you've got Jacobus, whatever, Jacob, as a direct object in a sentence. Then you've got Jacob as a possessive noun. I don't read the Greek, so I'm just taking this from the from the notes. Christine, maybe that story isn't true. Okay, maybe maybe do the research, then do the talking. Right, that's what I try to do. Okay, so now you've got this. I know Jacob. You can see this is Jacob, right? I know Jacob's brother, right? So there we go. The same name, the same name, the same name, Jacob. Mark thirteen three, right? It is Jacob, same name. Mark 15, 40, same name, Jacob. In Luke 9, 28, Jacob. Galatians 1, 19, Jacob. Okay. The last two letters after Jacob are words not being translated. See the scriptures for, okay, so this is from a scholar that has looked through this, right? That I took from notes on this. So what he does is literally the word in James is Jacob. It's the same word as all of these. It's the same. Everywhere else it's Jacob, but for some reason in James, they change it to James, and it is not being translated. So they are missing some of the letters, deliberately making a change. This was not an accident. This was 
Yes, the Mentel Bible. Yes, correct. I, I spoke with someone yesterday about that. I gave them the evidence and they don't like it. So, and lots of things, even, in, even, even there was the Bible in Old English from like the 700s. Okay, you can go back. The Bible was translated into English. And you know what? The Jesuits, the, the Pope did not send the Jesuits out to assassinate these people using blow dots and, and poison from those frogs from South America. Oddly enough, lots of the Bible was translated long before Mr. Wycliffe came along and the Jesuits were not sent out to murder anybody. Okay? I know, Christine, that's what the Germans are taught and that's absolutely not true. That's the weird part. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I love the German people, but it's apparent that many of them work hard at emulating lemmings. Yeah, sadly, well, Luther, okay. I mean, hey, I live next to Germany and I've got German family in my history, so... Okay, so guys, so from the guy's notes, uh, I can't read all this because that's all from a scholarly paper, right? I just grabbed it. But he says the name is literally Jacob. So in all these other instances, it's translated as Jacob. And then for some reason, they use James here. But, but he says the word in the Greek is Jacob, 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 Jacob. Okay, so it is literally Jacob and not being translated. That's the conclusion. So let me finish here. So to start, he says, a footnote could denote that James is really Jacob. So we need footnotes in the Bible. And while we're at it, let's rehabilitate Jacob as the name of the two of Jesus' disciples as well. Because that's also changed to James. These connections now, now lost only for English readers, were caught by Greek-speaking audiences as well as modern readers of translations in most other languages. It's only in English. Thanks, Wycliffe, right? You may know of the Gnostic. Now, here's the weird part. You might have heard of the Gnostic book, The First Apocalypse of James, right? Originally written in Aramaic, I believe, right? That's from the Nag Hammadi. And of course, you guys may not realize this, but, okay, uh, I can never remember what the word Nag means. Nag Hammadi. What is really weird, and I, this one is really hard to track. I, I've tried. I've spent a lot of time on this. Nag means like, like, Nag is like something important, something in, something of, of high stature. I can't remember exactly what it is. But you'll also find it Arabic, Naj, okay? Naj, something good, something. But Hamadi, Hamadi comes from Hamad, okay? Equals, oops, Muhammad. So it's like, it's like the, it's like the goodness of Muhammad, Okay, isn't it weird that the Nag Hammad, glory to Muhammad or something, the glory of Muhammad, okay, the Nag Hammadi, the glory of Muhammad. Isn't that weird that the Nag Hammadi, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, not the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they found the Nag Hammadi Gnostic texts, where all the Gnostic texts come from, the Nag Hammadi library, is named after Muhammad. Isn't that odd? They don't tell you this. Nag Hammadi, of Hamad, of Muhammad, the glory of Muhammad, Nag Hammadi, the D, tells you of Muhammad. So, does it make sense? Guys, what do you think of this? What are your thoughts? Does this make sense? There's something very weird here. Something of Muhammad. So, is this about Muhammad? All the Gnostic stuff. I, I have no reason for it. Distinguished. Yes. The distinguished of Muhammad or the distinguishment of Muhammad, the glory of Muhammad. Yes, something like that. Yes, distinguished. In Portuguese, we have a term called Gnosis Police. For those who see Gnosis, I'm afraid we might have to be, I might have become what I swore to, swore to destroy. <laughs> There's a lot more Gnosticism. One day I'm going to be a talk, doing a talk on Gnosticism in the Protestant Church. And yeah, it's not going to go well. I will play for you. What, I've, what I'll do is I will play for you talks from Gnostic preachers. And I'll ask you, is this a Christian talking? Is this a Christian preacher? Is this a Gnostic? Trust me, it is not that easy to distinguish between the two. Not so straightforward. You'd be listening to a Gnostic and you'd swear it's your priest talking. Okay, so let's, let's wind down. So you might know of the, the Gnostic, the first apocalypse of James. Okay, we all know it, the first apocalypse of James, except it's the first apocalypse of Jacob. Because, I don't know what it was in the, I believe in the Aramaic, it should say Jacob, right? But the Gnostic revelation of Jacob is the first letter now, hold on. So, you've all heard of the first apocalypse of James. No one's probably heard of the Gnostic revelation of Jacob. Have you heard of the revelation of Jacob? It is the first letter of the second apocalypse of James. So, there's the first apocalypse of James and the second apocalypse of James, except it's called the revelation of Jacob. So, even here in the Nag Hammadi codexes, it's Jacob, not James. And translators change the first one to James. They always change it to James. It's become embedded in the culture to change Jacob, Jacob, to James. So, <clears throat> the final thing is, let's give Jacob his due. It's actually the book of Jacob. It is Jacob, the brother of Jesus. 
So it's so PJ, now that's a very, very enlightened statement. No wonder Muslims always say Muhammad was mentioned in the Bible. Nag Hamadi, the distinguished Muhammad. Yes, they thought, remember, they thought the Injil was the Bible. It's clearly not. It's Gnostic. The Injil is clearly the Gnostic texts, right? Because the whole the whole Christology in the Quran is entirely Gnostic. That's why. I suspect this is where they get the idea of Muhammad and the whole Gnostic Jesus from the Nag Hammadi, because it's the distinguished of Muhammad or something of Muhammad. I've, I've looked it up. I can never, I never remember what Naj means, but distinguished is one translation, I believe. So I think the Duze is correct. Does the Nag Hammadi mention a large black mole? <laughs> I don't know. Um, the Mental Bible. So guys, that is it. That, that's that's the end. That's the end. I hope this was entertaining. I hope it was interesting. Uh, I've gone a little longer than I actually anticipated. Uh, I didn't think I would actually go this long. Let's see how long, see how long I've been up. Uh, I actually cannot tell. 80 people. Let me see. So I've been going for one, one hour, 25 minutes. Oh my God. That's longer than I anticipated. So guys, that is it for me. I hope it's been entertaining. Um, I hope you've learned something. And I do hope you've learned something valuable, something useful. I hope this has been educational. And we do need to be careful that there have been changes to the Bible. Okay. Now, I don't want to say that the Bible's been changed, that Muhammad was right. That's not where I'm going. But we need to understand that, that people have been trying to make changes. And these changes can and do matter. What's the next topic this week, if you don't mind me asking? Um, tomorrow, I should be doing a show at about 6.30 p.m., my time, which is about 5.30 UK time. I'll have to confirm with, with Thunderous. Um, but I'm guessing it's going to be around 5.36 UK time, and that would be around 1 or 12 o'clock New York time on um, the final chapter of Hitler versus Christianity. Was Hitler a Christian? And of course, the answer is no. <clears throat> no spoiler there, because there is no evidence for that. Um, so I think I've done a definitive takedown of that entire claim. And... Uh, uh, what is Galatians 1, 6 to 8, please? Um, Protestant believe if you can get that for me. Someone, Galatians 1, 6 to 8, the warning is quite clear. And um, then this week also I should be on with Sam on Wednesday, I believe. Uh, maybe Thursday, I can't remember what Sam said. Then I should be doing another chapter of atheism, the history of atheism and the, the um, doctrine of atheism. Yes, Eva, you can ask your question. Uh, Galatians 1 to 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ with another gospel. Yes, thank you, Galatians 1, 7 which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Yes, yes, thank you. Galatians 1.8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Fantastic. 80 watching, 80 likes, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. I'm Julie, very informative. Thank you, Lloyd. God bless us all. Yeah, thank you guys. So I appreciate the feedback. I, appreciate, I do appreciate the support. Um, hopefully this has been logical, sensible. It seems rational. What I'm presenting here, the the evidence is strong. I mean, it's um, horse says, "Thank you, Lloyd, and the enlightening session, proving that most humans are easily led astray." That's all of us, man. That's all of us. I've made too many mistakes. I was the 81st like. Thank you, Otto Christos. Uh, where's Eva's question? Eva, where's your question? Thanks for the lesson. <clears throat> uh, what does that mean, Raphael F? Classic extra ecclesian Nullusalus. I know a guy that has that name as his YouTube name, and the guy's a complete. Yeah, he's, Good grief. Ban him on sight. Uh, Eva, did you see those inscriptions in hebrew near Mount Sinai? Uh, no, I don't know too much about them. I've probably seen something on them. I do keep up with that, but I don't I, I don't know enough about them to comment. Um, but I will, I will, I can and will look into them at some point. I, I plan to, I need to pay for a subscription to um, Biblical, Archaeology, Biblical Archaeology Society to get the Biblical Archaeology Research whatever magazine, because it's really fantastic. Author Crystal's just got in. We'll have to rewatch. Thank you. Uh, Rusty says, uh, isn't it funny how everyone who's against Christ and the church always are what they claim the church to be? Yes. Atheists are irrational. Liberals are immoral. I will be talking about atheism more. We're going through using logic, principles of logic, and showing you just, just how weird these people are. It's a dogma to the Catholic Church that says outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Yeah, but the Catholic Church, if you look at the current catechism, doesn't say that, right? Because... They've taken a different stance in that we need to look at what is correct, what is true, and then reject what is error. So, <clears throat> yeah, if you look at, I think it's articles number 804 or something in the Catholic Catechism. I've been reading through that as well. Um, 
Yeah, Eva Mystini, thank you so much. Okay. So yeah, Eva, so I can't answer much more on that. I don't know enough about that topic to answer. But guys, thank you. Let's let's end it here. It's been like 90 minutes, so I should call it a night. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Again, I I hope you've learned something, right? I hope this has been helpful. Please use this information. Um, that's interesting, Rusty. Also, Catholic theologians have different meanings on that statement, like what it means to be outside the church. That's a very interesting point. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, much appreciated. Um, okay, well, thanks, guys. Let's call it here. Call it a night. And uh, tomorrow is another day. Yeah, Mount Sinai in Arabia. I like that theory. It, it kind of, yeah. Um, so, everyone, God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.